of uh, the Vena Holocaust Library. I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event, which we're holding to celebrate the awarding of the 2019 Frankel Prize to Heidi Torek for her amazing book, News from Germany. And uh, I actually realized while preparing for this talk that this year is actually the 30th anniversary of the Frankel Prize, which is a wonderful milestone to mark. Um, before we get into uh, talking about tonight's event, uh, I do want to just say a few words about the founder of the prize, Ernst Frankel, who I knew and who was a wonderful man. And I just think that since it's the 30th anniversary of the prize, it would be good to just spend a couple of minutes uh, paying tribute to him really um, as the founder of this amazing prize. So, so I thought I'd, I'd just share with you some of the uh, details from, from a biography of Ernst Frankel that was created uh, for a plaque that was created for him at the library, which you can now read on our website on our wall of honor. Ernst Frankel was born in Breslau, Germany in 1923, and he grew up there and in Berlin. He came to Britain age 16 on one of the last kinder transports from Germany in 1939, being separated from his parents and four siblings. He went to live in Bury, Lancashire, lodging with local families and attending the Bury Grammar School. After leaving school, he found his way to London during the war, working as an ag agricultural labourer. He returned to Germany with the American army and was able to find his mother, who had stayed there throughout the war, but who died shortly thereafter. He obtained a degree at the LSE, studying at night school with Harold Lasky and Ralph Miliband. Eventually, he started working at Philip Brothers, which became the premier global commodity trading firm of its day where he spent 35 years rising to become the head of its European operations and a member of its executive committee. And there's actually a lot of really fascinating details about Ernst's career, which you can find on our website if you want to go into a bit more detail. Um, as he approached retirement, Ernst was introduced to the Wiener Library and this actually came about as a result of a chance case of mistaken identity. He was erroneously confused with William Frankel, who was then editor of the Jewish Chronicle, but uh, that fortuitous mistake led to an amazing relationship where Ernst essentially helped the library through a period where it was threatened with closure as a result of serious financial difficulties, and his efforts were absolutely essential to averting the library's closure, so we owe him an immense debt for that. In 1990, he established the Frankel Prize, which was then called the Frankel Prize in Contemporary History. Now, uh, we've expanded the remit of the prize somewhat to embrace topics that are now uh, key to the library's interests, including uh, post-Holocaust genocides. Um, the Frankel Prize has become one of the most prestigious prizes in the field of history, and many previous winners have gone on to become internationally renowned scholars after having been first recognised really with the prize. And just a few names that you might know include Atina Grossman, Mark Metzauer and Nick Waxman, none of whom were full professors at the time when they won the prize. So again, it's, it's been an amazing uh, tool for bringing young, uh, talented and uh, early career scholars to, to real prominence. Ernst was a long-standing supporter of the University of Haifa. Uh, he was inspired by its commitment to the education of Jewish and Palestinian Israelis alongside each other. He held an honorary do doctorate from Haifa University, which was awarded in recognition of his services to Holocaust education. He was also a long-standing supporter of Labour Friends of Israel. In, light late, sorry, in later life, he was often called upon by schools to give first-hand recollections of his experiences of, for example, the Kristallnacht pogrom in 1938, uh, he did this movingly but sparingly. Uh, he didn't uh, wish to become a regular on, on the Holocaust education circuit, but nevertheless, he, he, he made an important contribution there. Ernst is survived by his wife, uh, Tilda, uh, who he met in Herlingen School in Germany in the 1930s, and also by his two children and five grandchildren. And I'm delighted to say that Martin and Ellen, uh, Ernst's son and daughter, who remain close friends of the library and generous supporters of this amazing prize are with us this evening. Before we kick off then, I just want to mention that the Frankel Prize 2020 is currently open for entry. So if any of you uh, meet the criteria and want to submit or know someone who might want to submit, please look at the details on our website. So to the 2019 prize, in addition to Heidi's book, uh, I, I should mention that the judging panel also highly commended another finalist, Dr. Jeffrey Kerber of Chapman University who uh, wrote Borderland Generation, Soviet and Polish Jews under Hitler, uh, which offers an original and groundbreaking exploration of the ways in which young Polish and Soviet Jews fought for survival 
uh, and also the complex impulses that shaped uh, the, the way that they survived. So well done to Jeffrey on, on that achievement. But tonight we're here especially to celebrate the amazing achievement of Heidi Twarek of the University of British Columbia in Canada for her book, News from Germany, The Competition to Control World Communications, 1900 to 1945. Dr. Twarek is Associate Professor of International History and Public Policy at the University of British Columbia. She's non-resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. She's currently working on the history of policy and health communications. In addition to winning the Frankel Prize, News from Germany has been widely praised by reviewers and has also been awarded the Ralph Gamori Prize of the Business History Conference, for which additional congratulations. The book, uh, which I highly recommend, uncovers how Germans fought to regulate information at home and use the innovation of wireless technology to magnify their power abroad. Communication networks became a crucial battleground for interwar domestic democracy and international influence everywhere from Latin America to East Asia. Uh, imperial leaders uh, in Germany and their Weimar and Nazi successors nurtured wireless technology to make news from Germany a major source of information across the globe. And the Nazi attempt at mastery of global propaganda by the 1930s was built, built on this decades long obsession in Germany with the news. And I think it's, it's really interesting to think about this uh, also uh, with a scholar uh, who, who has done a lot of work on British history, Professor Joe Fox, who I'll introduce in a moment. But yes, it seems to me that, that there's also a British obsession with news, which is perhaps something that we can reflect on in uh, the talk later today. So Professor Jo Fox is the Director of the Institute of Historical Research just opposite the library. She's Professor of Modern History at the University of London. She leads on the Institute's strategic development as the UK's National Centre for History. Uh, she's a historian of the modern era and a specialist in the history of propaganda, rumour and truth telling. So absolutely the perfect match for tonight. And most of this evening's event will be led by a conversation between Jo and Heidi. I just want to make you aware that audio captioning is available, so if uh, you would like to make use of that function, please look at the, the bar at the bottom, you should see an option for closed captions. Also, if you have questions and they come to you in the course of the conversation, please do type them into the chat, we'll be collecting them throughout and uh, Joe will be monitoring that as well I, so we'll have the chance to integrate the questions at the end. So with that, I will hand over to Joe to begin the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toby. It's a great pleasure to be here. And Heidi, many, many congratulations on your wonderful book and uh, on winning the prize. It's a real privilege to be able to talk to you uh, about it this evening. I'd just like to start by asking you, how did you come to this subject? I had to be unmuted by the host. <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say, um, Thank you to Toby and Christine for organizing this. Thank you to the adjudicatory, adjudicatory committee and thank you so much to the Frankel family for being here. It's a real honor. I wish we could do it in person, but uh, perhaps it's even appropriate that a book that's about new technologies is then discussed across new technologies. Um, so I actually came to this book in many ways by realizing what I didn't know. So when I was doing my master's degree at Harvard, I started to look into my weird obsession with the 1866 um, Austro-Prussian War. And I thought I'd look at newspaper representations of this war. And I was delving into them. And then I asked myself, but where did newspapers get their news from? And realized that in fact, both sides of this war were getting their news from a French news agency. And then I realized the paper I was writing made no sense because I had made all these interpretations of what the newspapers were doing and it had nothing to do with what was really happening, which was the networks behind the news. And so I started to ask myself, well, how do these networks behind the news work? What are these news agencies that seem to really be the fundamental bottleneck of news? And that's where the idea for this book really came from. And I thought it was going to be when I went into the archives, really a story about Germans fighting for control of German news within Germany. And the archives completely changed my vision of what that was. And, and I think that's probably a good sign for a history book that what you thought you were going to write before you went to the archives is not at all what you found. Because what I found instead was a story that was longer in time. It was one that went into the Nazi period with all sorts of continuities. It went back before World War I. And it was also a global story of Germans not just fighting to control news within Europe, but fighting to try and control news around the world in all sorts of places that I hadn't expected, like uh, China or Latin America. <laughs> 
I mean, that, let, let's just pick up on that. You know, what, what I think is most extraordinary about the book is its emphasis on the movement of news and the control of news across borders, that transnational dimension. And I wonder what that approach reveals of the subject that standard histories that focus on the nation and one country just can't. So often I think a lot of histories of, of news have tended to be quite national in focus, in part because if you look at newspapers, radio, television, those sorts of products, you, you tend to actually be focusing just on that national context for very understandable reasons. But when we start to look at the networks behind the news, what we see is that there isn't actually as much variety as we might think by just looking at newspapers. So in the case of news agencies, really from the mid 19th century all the way up until World War II, there's a cartel of just four main news agencies. And these are the news agencies that are in fact collecting and distributing the vast majority of international and even national news. So what we get through this international approach is actually we see a lack of variety. We see a kind of oligopoly, um, which is part of why Germans uh, are so interested in trying to control this because looking at the networks behind the news shows this very narrow bottleneck of news agencies. And so I think this, this tells a very, very different picture of how news actually functions, how it is produced, and what are the power levers that, that lie behind those newspapers? Yeah, and, that, and ultimately the book is really about power and the media, isn't it? About power and, and, and its many manifestations and those drivers behind the news. What were some of the surprising things that you found about that in the course of your research? Yeah, so it's actually, I think, in some ways quite an unusual book about news, because often books about news are, are much more about um, cultural interpretations. You could read news through the lens of, for example, gender or, or race, and you're really doing deep readings of, of the products you see in newspapers or magazines. And so in that sense, my book is quite unusual, because as you say, it's about power, and it's often about, it's about political power, um, economic power, technological power. So in some ways, it's a book that's about news and international relations and, and politics. So that's, I think, quite unusual for a book about news. And that's because when I went into the archives and looked at who was actually interested in German news agencies, what did they want to do with them? Who was funding them? What I found was uh, people at the very highest echelons of um, industrial power, like an Alfred Hugenberg or a Hjalmar Schacht, who of course is, is important in the Nazi period, but those people are interested in news from the early 1900s. So they're really invested in news for, for a 30, 40 year period building up to the, the Nazi period. Um, but so too politicians of the highest echelons. And um, one of the news agencies that I look at, Transocean or Transocean, when it's created in 1913, um, it decides to have its board meetings at the very famous Hotel Adlon, which people who've been to Berlin might know because it's uh, right next to the Brandenburg Gate. And its board includes the Hjalmar Schachts, um, but it also includes Gustav Stresemann, who will go on to become uh, the Chancellor and, and Foreign Minister of Weimar Germany. So we see that the, the actual people who are invested in news agencies who are supplying the funding, they're at the very highest political and economic echelons. And maybe the other thing that I would say is what really surprised me about that was that it was people across the political spectrum. So I had thought that perhaps it would be people more on the right who were more interested in controlling news, but actually one thing that, that bound uh, politicians across the political spectrum was that they believed that using news was a way to gain political or economic power. Now they wanted to use that power for very different purposes, um, but they were all trying to use news agencies as a form of control. So that's what really bound them all together. So I, I call this a news agency consensus, meaning the belief that you can control news by controlling these businesses uh, behind the scenes. And the book really looks at the many different ways in which that happens over 45 years. Yeah, I mean, can we expand on that? I mean, that's what unites them, but they're obviously coming together from lots of different perspectives, aren't they? And you've got that interplay between sort of power politics, political influence, and what might be gained in, in now the democratic age. But of, all, of course, you know, what's really interesting about the book is it starts to look at the business around news, that this is, this is a capital proposition, isn't it? I wonder whether you could reflect on the intersections between news as a political medium and news as a business proposition in that period. Yeah, so one of the, the terms that I use comes uh, from a scholar called Richard John, who's been working on the history of communications for a long time in the American context. And he talks about um, political economy, meaning the ways in which those two things actually run together. Um, and, and I think it's particularly interesting in the case of news agencies. So unlike 
um, a lot of other news businesses, it's actually very hard to make money with news agencies. Um, and this is for sort of economic reasons. So um, to explain basically news agencies, what they do from the mid 19th century when they're created is um, they're really invested in large national international news. So news agencies, the first one is Agence Savas, founded in Paris, swiftly followed by um, Wolfsburg Grafters Bureau in Berlin, and then Reuters um, founded also by a, a Jewish man uh, born in the German lands, he then goes to, to London. But what all of them do is they station correspondents abroad who then send that news back by telegram. And this is incredibly expensive. There are a lot of fixed and sunk costs to that. You need your correspondent there, even if there might not be news, telegrams are very expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite hard to make money with the system. Um, and this means that there are both levers for economic power and political power. Um, levers for, for example, um, politicians like Bismarck to intervene, to create um, Wolfs as basically a semi-official news agency, where there are effectively subsidies because Wolfs is allowed to send its telegrams before any other news agency. Um, but in return, it has to show its more political news telegrams to the Prussian government and then later the German government to get actually permission to send some of them out. So we see the ways in which politics and economics are intertwined here in this political economy. And we see that play out in different ways through different news agencies. So the one that I've just mentioned, Volkstuhlgrafsches Büro, is the main German news agency all the way up until the Nazi period. And it's always negotiating between the fact that it's part of this global cartel, which has been formed for economic reasons, but then it's also dependent on the German government to be the preeminent news agency. So political economy helps us to describe how these two things are intertwined. Um, but another example of that is um, the control of uh, Telegraph Union, a more right-wing news agency uh, created by industrialist Alfred Hugenberg, who I just talked about. Um, so in the Weimar Republic, Hugenberg becomes much more of a political figure, um, but he also creates the first vertically integrated uh, media empire within Germany. So that means everything from the advertisements you see in the newspaper all the way back through the newspapers, through to news agencies, and so on, um, and even the banks that are actually <laughs> supplying the financing to news to newspapers. And so for Hugenberg, this news agency that has Telegraph Union, it's a loss leader, it doesn't make money, but it's vertically integrated to control news also for right-wing political purposes. So that's why I talk about political economy because it's very hard to disentangle the two. Politic political and economic power are intertwined in trying to control the news just from very different perspectives, whether it's you know Democrats within the Weimar Republic, or it's um, right-wing reactionaries like Alfred Huckenberg. I mean, it's interesting, Heidi, then you go back to talk there about Bismarck, because we often think, don't we, of the, the First World War as being this great turning point in terms of news, distribution of news, propaganda especially. This is seen as being the moment where it all ignites, but your book tells a, a different story of, of the First World War in that respect, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, in my, in my telling, World War I is more of an accelerant than it is a, a massive turning point. And it's, it's really in a couple of ways. I mean, one is that it really solidifies uh, German elite beliefs that news is incredibly important. Um, whether it is those on the right who believe in a stab in the back legend, um, they will attribute a lot of the loss to um, propaganda, or it's even those in the center and the left who spend quite a lot of the early 20s writing books reflecting on how much propaganda there should be and what kinds of propaganda are the right types of propaganda. I mean, that's a, you know, a transnational discussion that, that happens uh, across the Atlantic and also in Britain as well. But you can see this obsession. And what I see, though, is that that begins in the pre-World War I period. And then the other part of this is the global part. And so this is maybe another thing that surprised me when I went to the archives was to really see that um, while Bismarck is certainly very concerned with news, he's really only interested in the inner German aspects of news and how one controls it. And what really starts to change around 1900 is that German elites start to think about Germany as somewhere that should be a global power, um, a global geopolitical power, a global trading power, um, but they also think that Germany should be a global power in news. And when they look at the system that existed, they see one that they believe is boxing Germany in. And so it's really from 1900 onwards that you see elites start to believe that there have to be ways for, for Germans to push their news out in a global vein. And World War I only accelerates those beliefs 
that one of the reasons why, for example, more neutral countries in Latin America seem to lean towards the British and the French, uh, many German elites believe, is because they've been supplied with British and French news much more than German news. And so that just accelerates this desire in the Weimar Republic and onwards to use news agencies as a way to get news from Germany to countries and people who have never received news from Germany directly before. Um, and there, the final thing I'll say, maybe the, the other accelerant is the use of wireless technology to do so, which then becomes radio technology. And that's very much accelerated development through World War I. Um, various German ministries have this sort of half-baked scheme that they're going to make a, a world wireless network that I talk about in the book. And, you know, it delves into all the kind of espionage stories that, <laughs> that one would like, you know, people sending secret letters, et cetera. Um, but that builds on already 20 years of German investment in wireless. And that's accelerated then through World War I because of this belief that you cannot rely on cables, which can be cut. You need something that can go through the air that cannot necessarily be uh, intercepted in times of war. And that this is the way you can create a global technological network where you can send news from Germany directly to former German colonies, East Asia, Latin America. So it's, it's quite a different way of thinking about World War One, I, I think, than a lot of books that write about it as a break. I see it as a, an accelerant of continuities of these German beliefs and investments. I mean, it's really interesting. One of the things that I find really fascinating about, about this area is this interrelationship between communications and technology. And it's something that we're still obsessed with. And, and, and what you've, you've shown there is that, that the possibilities, the connectivity in terms of communications and, and technology, but there's also the converse side of that, isn't there? The kind of social fears, the moral panics about how that network grows and influence of the masses and so on. So you get the two flip sides of this relationship between communications and technology, one a great democratizer and one something that, that seeks to influence the masses in this pernicious way. And it's the technology that is, is, is the driver of it. It's the technology that's the problem. Look at what the technology can do. Look at how destructive it can be. And it's all tied up with debates around modernity. And you certainly see that in the 20s and 30s, don't you? This is a really hot topic in those, those decades. Yes, and I think what, what you can also see in the, the German case is how the development of wireless and radio technology are really influenced by these visions of what the technology should achieve. So for example, with early wireless, which basically is sending signals through the air through Morse code, so it's, it's not spoken at that point. Um, what you see is that very initially, um, the other sort of main person driving that technology is, is Marconi, who we've all sort of heard of, and his vision is he's going to have a monopoly, so it'll be just his devices. Um, and the, the German government at the time, uh, led by the Kaiser Wilhelm II, have a different vision of what they want wireless to be, which is to be something that can supersede these cable technologies for those military reasons that I've described. But there's also a vision that you can then reach as many people as possible. This is a vision of what we would call one to many, meaning you have one tower and you reach as many people as possible, and that it's absolutely not a monopoly of devices. And, and what I can trace is how that then really changes the development of wireless itself, right? It becomes this slightly more open, one to many, and that then translates into radio, this idea you want to reach as many people as possible through controlling the airwaves and so on. And that, that wasn't preordained. Um, it was because of these political economic choices. Um, and certainly historians of technology have, have talked for a long time, right, about how innovation is determined by use and so on and so forth. Um, there's also a lot of power politics that lies behind it. If we think about investments, you know, even <laughs> the internet technology that's enabling us to have this conversation was initially mm. funded by um, US military funding, right, through through DARPA, and then made commercialized. There are certain visions that go behind what you fund and what you don't. And we certainly see that in the case of wireless. And then into the 20s, um, I talk in the book a lot about how um, radio ends up getting regulated in the Weimar Republic. And a lot of that has to do with fears of what people will do <laughs> if they receive news too swiftly. So, so the man who's in charge of regulation, Hans von Bredel, he's really driven by a desire to preserve democracy, but a fear that if too many people receive news too quickly, um, this can spur revolution. 
um, and he's very influenced by the world of the early 1920s in the Weimar Republic, where there are um, revolts and revolutions from the right and the left. And, and for Bredo, his vision of a democracy and what radio should do is it should educate people, it should bring them together, but it should not foment revolution. He thinks news will will do that. So a lot of his regulation, the way radio develops in that period is because he sees it as a place to try to preserve democracy by actually <laughs> having more government control, uh, keeping news out or more supervised. Um, the sad irony of, of that story to sort of finish it off is that as the Weimar Republic becomes more and more febrile, um, Bredel believes you need more and more state supervision of content. Um, and the tragedy of that is when the Nazis come to power, they can immediately supervise all of that content. So it's one of these terrible, tragic tales of unintended consequences that someone who is invested in protecting democracy and, and taking steps to do so actually ends up opening the door for the Nazis to control radio content before they even control um, news agencies. So it's a, it's a complex tale, but I think it, it really shows us how regulation and choices we make around regulation can really shape the, the development of how we can use technologies in the first place. I mean, that really leads us on to one of these really difficult questions, doesn't it, about the relationship between mass media and the democratic process. And you've just beautifully ir illustrated the, these in inherent tensions, I guess, uh, between control, propaganda and liberal democratic principles. And I don't think that's something that you certainly observe in this period, um, but it's a tension that I don't think we've... Uh, resolved um, and we're still anxious aren't we about this sort of pernicious information uh, infosphere I guess um, and especially those relationships between liberal democracy and freedom of thought and I've always been struck by Michael Sproul the historian Michael Sproul's observation that um, liberal democracies have struggled with that balance of the right to persuade and then the right of the public to free choice. And there's extraordinarily extraordinary parallels to now and debates now. And did those parallels strike you when you were undertaking your research? Because, you know, it, it, when you were researching this, I mean, this all hit the news in, in a big way. 2017, fake news, Collins Dictionary, Word of the Year, followed by Oxford Dictionary's proclamation that post-truth was the word of the year. Um, you're right in the middle of it. You're writing this history and then it starts becoming made around you with very, very similar discussions and debates. I mean, how did, how did that feel? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was quite extraordinary. You know, the present caught up with history in all of these different ways. And, and when you look at the, the documents and what people are really debating, especially in the 1920s, there are so many extraordinary parallels, um, whether it's, you know, I was looking at people like Walter Lippmann, who are writing yeah. about this in, in the United States, and, and Lippmann helps to work with the American government briefly during World War One, and afterwards is deeply concerned with the idea of, of governments intervening in propaganda. But not just that, he's also concerned with the role of newspapers in truth telling. So he does this study of how the New York Times covered the Russian Revolution and is just scathing <laughs> about um, the New York Times' ability to actually provide uh, truthful reporting. So when you, when you read Lippmann's work, you feel like you're, you know, he wrote a, almost a century ago, and yet we're still grappling with the same questions. So he write this, writes this book about public opinion, which is, you know, trying to say one of the problems is that we actually are asking too much of news. We're asking news and media to actually solve the problems that institutions like courts or governments should be solving. So it's one of the reasons why I end this book with Lippmann. Um, so one of the one of the hardest things of having a, a history book where the present keeps catching up is how do you write a conclusion? <laughs> uh, so I, I, ha I had about 15 versions of the conclusion. You know, should it be an epilogue? Should I talk about 2015, 16, 17? And in the end, I decided not to do that because it is a, it is a work of history. It needs to be yeah. You know, analyzing that history. And it has things to tell us about the present, but one of the things it has to tell us about the present is that our discussions are not unprecedented. And yeah. that actually many of these things we are trying to grapple with the role of new technology, um, who gets to have a voice, where is the balance between 
um, free speech and democracy. These are all things that I write about in the book people are grappling with. And so to end with Lippmann, and I actually use quite a lot of his quotations to show this is something we've been grappling with for a hundred years. And, and actually it serves us quite well, I think, to, to go back and read someone like Lippmann, whether we agree or disagree, just to get that better understanding of what's unprecedented about our moment and what actually is a much deeper discussion about the role of media in democracy. And I think one of the points that Lippmann makes that is so important is that we, we run astray if we say, okay, all of the problems that we have in society, um, the media can solve them. <laughs> and sometimes I fear that our discussions of the last five to 10 years are going down that route. If we can only solve this problem of information, then everything else will be fine. And Lippmann warns us in 1922 that, <laughs> that that's the wrong discussion. We need to talk about our institutions as much as our news media. Yeah, that's such an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've done some research on different, different commentators on this, but they fall into that exact pattern. Either It's either or, either uh, the media is the solution to all of the democratic problems, or it's it's the problem, uh, and 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 the whole debate around what's going to happen with democracy if you let this unleash? Do you control it? Do you restrain it? What does control look like? All of those debates still still very live. I mean, I'm, I'm very struck by the use of your word unprecedented because we hear all the time now that social media, what we're experiencing, disinformation, fake news, all of this in that space is unprecedented, yet there are precedents, as your book so beautifully um, demonstrates. So what are your reflections on then what genuinely is unprecedented mm -hmm. and, and where, the, where the real parallels lie? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a funny thing when I was revising the, the book for publication right at the end, I did something which you usually don't do, which is I put in more quotations from archives and people at the time, because I had to show that these were the words people were using. People were talking about false news and lies. <laughs> so a lot of the ways in which we, we talk about it were actually being used by, by people in the 20s. And, and I include the sort of anatomy of one story that is falsified, where I can actually show how it gets falsified. And um, because I think it was really important for people to understand this is how this was unfolding. And, and this particular one that, that I look into, it nearly causes a trade treaty between the Soviet Union and Weimar Germany to fall apart. So it nearly has profound political and economic consequences. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was to really use people's words at the time to show, okay, the, a lot of the ways in which we're talking about this are, are actually <laughs> are actually in many ways from the 20s. I would say also one of the disturbing things of, of this moment was seeing within Germany itself some of the terms that get used by the Nazis be revived. Yeah. Um, like Lügenpresse, lying press, that actually not, not only within Germany with, with various anti- um, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee or Islamophobic demonstrations, but also to see them actually come into uh, the United States from neo-Nazis as well was, was truly and, and deeply disturbing. So I needed to really sort of contextualize those words and, and where they had come from. So a lot of, bizarrely, some of the things that, <laughs> that I was writing about had become current. Um, others I need to show there was, there was discourse behind it. But then in terms of what's really unprecedented in our moment, yeah. I think that some of it is our ability to target very, very small groups of people who can be like-minded. So in the era that I'm writing about, even if um, Germans can disseminate their news behind the scenes and it can um, end up that a German news agency is the most printed news source in Japanese occupied China in the early 1940s, that's still sort of a mass medium. Uh, what we have now though is the ability, if I go on Facebook, to micro-target a very specific group of people. Um, so let's say, you know, I want to target uh, women who like knitting X, Y, Z, I can do that. It's much, much more targeted. Um, and the other thing that I think is quite unprecedented is the ability to learn very, very quickly what does and doesn't work from mm -hmm. behavioral patterns. So let's say I'm an advertiser. Uh, yeah. I can actually learn very, very quickly what ads do and don't work. Um, and that's certainly not something that I see in my sources. <laughs> I mean, there you have to have, you have a sort of much more blanket strategy. Perhaps it's a little bit divvied up by language, maybe a little bit by country, but there's no way that you can segment an audience audience in the way that you can today. The barrier to entry is so incredibly low today. Those I think are the unprecedented elements. But what isn't unprecedented is we have a small group of companies 
um, who are able to control the ways in which we communicate with each other. We might want to do a different kind of conversation, but there's only a small number of video platforms. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure all of us have thought about the, the flaws of Zoom, <laughs> um, but the fact is there are only a few companies that control this, a few companies that control social media, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. And I think there's really a parallel. It's not unprecedented. That's what we had with news agencies, small group of companies that control the ways in which we can communicate with each other. So I think what we can do with this history is not say, oh, this moment is exactly like X moment back in time, but rather let's think through very carefully what is and isn't unprecedented. What were the solutions that were tried before? And that I think gets us to a much more reasonable policy discussion <laughs> rather than the one that claims we've never confronted a technology that amplifies hate before. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting that you focus on the, that small handful of companies, because that that's where we come to some of the real the real issues now, because the million dollar question was, OK, just as it was then, how do you control then the media? How do you control information in, in such a way as to, you know, we're asking, how do we do that where we don't do damage to democracy? And, and a lot of the attention has fallen on those that small handful of companies and it that's where you control it you control it at source you make them responsible um, and you start to regulate now there are parallels to what you're talking about in the book so I wonder what how that historical perspective uh, permits you to to see how this issue should be approached in the present yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, it's it's one of the things that inspired me to get involved in uh, public policy in the first place in those discussions, because it really concerned me that actually there wasn't a historical perspective. There were many extremely well-informed perspectives in these uh, what we call platform governance discussions, but there weren't really these historical perspectives. So that's one of the reasons that I sort of got inspired to, to get involved in, in those sorts of discussions and ended up testifying before a bunch of governments and so on and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, we see a couple of ways in which this, this history is, is truly important. One is this lesson of unintended consequences that I talked about before, that there actually is a balance. Um, and it's a hard one to strike, um, but to think about the unintended consequences of what you do by intervening to figure out how much government control is really acceptable is, I, I think, truly important because you, you might, like Hans von Brido, a policymaker might believe, and, and they truly are in their heart trying to preserve democracy, but the structures that they have created, unfortunately, open a door for authoritarian regimes. Um, and I think in this present moment, that's particularly important because these platforms are so global. And any policy implemented in any country can end up being uh, copied and pasted or used in authoritarian regimes. And, and I think I personally look with, with deep concern at the tragedies that happened in places like Myanmar, um, where Facebook was used by generals to propagate genocidal speech. Um, we've seen the same in Ethiopia over the summer. So I think part of the lesson that, that we can draw is, okay, we, <laughs> we need to think about a balance here. We need to think about long-term consequences, but it doesn't mean that we do nothing um, because we also see the ways in which platforms can be weaponized if we want to use that, that terminology and that it shouldn't necessarily be that we just have a sort of libertarian, <laughs> but, but there are multiple different ways in which we can try and deal with these problems. Some of which could also bring in um, civil society to talk about this, can amplify those sorts of voices, um, can also bring us greater transparency to know what the platforms are doing, um, and can also bring in experts. I mean, it's, it's, it is an extraordinary thing that only over the last few days has uh, Facebook said that it will no longer allow Holocaust denial on its platform. Um, and that is, to a large extent, the result of um, research and pressure from civil society groups who have, you know, changed Mark Zuckerberg's mind. Two years ago, he said um, Holocaust denial was an example of something that he would allow on the platform <laughs> um, because it was, you know, people expressing their, their freedom of speech and so on and so forth. We've seen a real change there. Maybe the final thing that I'll say is I think that what's important from the debates of history is that there isn't just one version of what free expression is. There's actually many, many different visions of that within democratic societies. And that I think is truly important in a moment where basically most of the platforms are based in the US. They have a very particular vision of what free speech is, which is the, the first amendment driven vision, which means that government stays out. Um, it's quite libertarian, we might say. Um, whereas other democracies like Canada or Germany or even Britain, 
actually think that the freedom of speech is not just that that negative element, but also the positive that you should, for example, in the case of Canada, um, its Charter of Rights and Freedoms has a provision for multiculturalism. So you have subsidies to ensure that you have French language, that you have women film directors, that you have indigenous voices. That's a really different version of freedom of expression, um, but it also is relevant. And I, maybe the final thing I'll say is that um, one of the most interesting things to see has been how Germany has tried to deal with this. Yeah. Um, and Germany has really been in many ways one of the most active democracies in trying to say we need to figure out regulation. You know, our history means yeah. that we have to contemplate um, ways to deal with these problems and we have to find ways to hold platforms to account. And we can discuss whether <laughs> whether the laws that have been enacted are the right way or not. Um, but certainly the, the activity in Germany has tried to draw on these historical lessons. So <laughs> um, some of the German politicians have uh, heard me talk about the book and, and I've given it to them. So there are ways I think in which this history really is directly feeding into how policymakers think about this, but I think also is feeding into the urgency that the German politicians feel in particular to deal with this problem because they feel a deep responsibility. Yeah, that, that's really interesting and all played out, you know, with all of these different versions deeply sort of culturally and historically rooted, played out on international fora. And, and that, that sort of tension between that international, um, the platform being international, while having all of these national histories play into it, all of these national approaches play into it. I mean, we're, uh, we're starting to get a, a question or two in the, in the chat uh, and, um, and, and thinking about relationships to the present. One of the questions is around what you're working on now. And you mentioned at the beginning that you're working on health. I mean, again, a highly topical subject, the relationship between health, health and communications, highly relevant. You found, uh, did you, did you, have you found yourself again in that space where you started to work on, on something that then suddenly was propelled into, into the public mind in a very profound way? Oh, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Someone joked I should just stop writing new histories because it's <laughs> quite dangerous. <laughs> um, but yes, I'd actually um, sort of stumbled on the topic in a, for a whole host of different reasons because another hat that I wear is um, running a, a website about the history of the United Nations. Mm. And someone had asked me to, to give a talk about the United Nations um, and health. And I thought, oh, well, you know, I should look and see what, what has been done in health communications. And I found all these fascinating sources about the creation of um, the first international epidemiological intelligence network by the League of Nations. I thought, oh, this is fascinating. And it ended up actually using a lot of the, the wireless networks that I had written about in this book, but being used for a very, very different purpose. You saw um, French, British, German, and others cooperating through these wireless networks to disseminate this news about various diseases around the world. And this is, of course, a you know, complicated and, and interesting story. But this is what started to get me interested in health communication. You know, why did the League of Nations even want to do this? What was their interest in information? Why weren't they doing other things related to health? Why did they believe in this power of information, and um, particularly to stop epidemics? So the, their vision was, we can spread information about epidemics faster than the epidemic itself arrives, then officials can contain it. <laughs> um, and this was particularly connected to wireless because wireless was the first technology that could interact with moving ships on the sea. And so of course in the interwar period, this is really before mass travel through airplanes. So diseases are moving via ships and that's why wireless uh, becomes so important. So this is how I got into this topic. You can see sort of the ways in which it, it does carry on some of the themes of, of the first book. And I'd been, pottering away at this on the side and you know published an article about it and then um and, and i remember people would say to me you know is this really such an important topic aren't epidemics kind of over haven't we figured that out and i would say no i'm i'm pretty sure we we haven't i mean the experts in the field <laughs> of public health and epidemiology tell us this is still yeah. a big problem and when it happens you know communications is going to be really vital um, and thus uh, unfortunately it has proven so i actually spent a lot of the last six months i gathered a team together and we've written a report about how um, communications happen in nine democracies around the world and what we can learn in terms of doing better uh, communications. So the, the thing that we argue is basically that communications is a vital 
non-pharmaceutical interventions. So NPIs are things like wearing masks and physical distancing and so on. Um, but communicating clearly and effectively is also a non-pharmaceutical intervention because if we know what to do, we're encouraged to do it, we comply, um, we save lives. So this report is really sort of about that. So now I'm in the process of figuring out um, how do you write a book when you can't go to archives? <laughs> when you have some archival material, but you don't have others? How do you write a book that's um, about history, but has all these policy implications? So uh, very much kind of in the same space as, as this uh, other book, I suppose, um, because it's about communications and about technology, uh, but in the realm of health rather than in the realm of, of disinformation. I mean, I guess it may be too early to say, of course, in, in the research, but in as you've been looking at all of these different manifestations now, is it possible to say that, that some nations have handled this a lot better than others in terms of their communication strategies? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so we uh, we looked at nine really very different countries. So we looked at um, Canada, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Senegal, New Zealand, South Korea and Taiwan. Um, so you know, still an expansion of my sort of global purview, although we still had Germany in the mix. Um, but I have to say, you know, places like Senegal, South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand have a tremendous amount to teach us, um, whether it's sort of boring institutional stuff like in uh, Taiwan and in South Korea, they have sort of institutions to communicate. So they have people who have capacity to communicate or it's how those countries pulled in civil society in different ways, communicate in ways that the diverse sets of their population could understand. So say in Senegal, um, the really important leaders are religious leaders. So um, Muslim leaders and Christian leaders were pulled in from the beginning to communicate with people. But they also did cool stuff like in Dakar, they got a graffiti group to go around and make these just beautiful murals of people wearing masks, right? Um, so actually, you know, being a, being a natural optimist, continually challenged by reality, this was actually a really wonderful and inspiring report to write because had a fantastic team of um, graduate students, postdoc and an undergrad who did this research. And we also found all these examples of countries um, pursuing really effective communications. I think it shows us that um, better is possible. It's a lot of work, um, but it is possible to have communications that are effective. Um, and even I'll, I'll end by saying in South Korea, one of the amazing things we're seeing um, that these communications really did have an effect and it was a very recent effect. So um, South Korea had a lot of problems with the MERS outbreak of 2015. So after that, they really reformed their public health system to be able to deal with infectious diseases and epidemics. And one core pillar was having an office of communications and really thinking about that. Um, and studies have found vastly increased compliance in South Korea with public health guidelines. So I think it's, it's a really optimistic message actually that um, change is possible, it can happen very quickly and that communication really can help to increase compliance with public health guidelines. Fascinating. I'm gonna bring you back now to the book that we're honoring this evening because we have several questions now in the chat. Uh, and one is around um, the Western industrial working classes, you know, Britain, Germany, US, the epicenters of the, the, Western, the, the Western industrial working class, all of whom have their own news cultures. So the question is really how the news agencies that you, you looked at think, thought about and talked about the working class. Oh, it's a great question. And I think it also really ties into the history of technology, particularly of radio, because one of the things that we see happening in the 1920s is how radio regulation actually shuts out really important working class amateur cultures around radio. Um, so we see that happen in Germany in part because of these fears from Hans von Friedel that if you allow people unfettered access to communication and um, this can foment revolution. So he ends up really sort of eliminating a lot of the amateur culture um, where people were communicating with each other on, on what we would now call ham radios. And um, the same thing happens in, in the United States and also in Britain to a certain extent. Um, and news agencies are quite willing to participate in that because they worry about the erosion of their power to control news. Um, so in many ways, what news agencies are doing is actually sort of shutting out a lot of those perspectives. It's very much a middle class, upper middle class pursuit. Um, and one in which uh, journalists, even if they are working class, when they go into news, they see it as a way to sort of become more middle class. So a lot of what we see, I think, in the 20s is a shutting down by regulation, which news agencies participate in, of the possibility of more, even more working class news and culture. Yeah, 
Thank you. Another question that, that we've got is, is around um, the commercial value of fast news. And there's a question around whether you know, speed was the crucial thing in terms of a competitive edge, reflective of the, the coffee houses in London or, and the shipping news, or is it the quality of the news? Uh, that, that, that gives it the commercial edge or the entertainment value? Which, which of those is, is more important in terms of the, the commercial value? Oh yeah, it's a great question. I mean, this sort of speed versus accuracy question is how I like to think about it. Because I think it's another one of these examples where that trade-off actually goes all the way up to the present, right? We actually see this debate, for example, um, around what platforms are going to do after the US election. <laughs> um, and now they've come out and said, okay, we're not going to allow anybody to prematurely declare victory. And we're actually going to rely, um, they say on news agencies, right? Like the Associated Press for accuracy. Um, but this idea of speed versus accuracy is extremely crucial, um, particularly in this, this moment of the Weimar Republic, because one of the things that happens is that Wolfs has, as I said, this semi-official relationship with um, the Weimar government as well, which it negotiates. And it's one of the ways it protects itself commercially is that it's faster, right? It gets government news faster. It disseminates it to newspapers before anybody else. And that's how it maintains a, a pretty monopolistic stance within Germany. One of the things that starts to happen over the course of the 20s, though, is that Alfred Hugenberg's news agency Telegraph Union slowly, slowly starts to erode that advantage. Um, part of how it does it, though, is by being inaccurate, but faster. <laughs> so, so Wolfs complains and says, you know, Weimar governments, um, you shouldn't be giving access to the Telegraph Union because it breaks all the rules. For example, you know, you give them a speech in advance and they just send it out earlier than we do. They're breaking the rules um, or they're sending out all this inaccurate news, but faster, whereas we are more deliberate and slower, but we're accurate. So um, this is one of the key debates um, that Wolfs keeps having with, with various Weimar governments to say, shut Telegraph Union out. They are faster, but they are more inaccurate. Um, and the Weimar government and different ministries are sort of fighting about this. Um, and in particular, it sort of breaks down, um, which gets the commercial aspect, it breaks down um, because of the finance ministry. Um, so the finance ministry in the late 1920s says, um, we actually don't care who's more accurate or not. Um, we just need people to know, for example, um, how to pay their taxes. And in this world that is increasingly divided, where more and more, some newspapers are only getting wolves and some are only getting Telegraph Union. We don't care about some decades old deal that another part of the Weimar government has with uh, wolves. We just need everybody to be able to know finance information. So we are going to break the sort of pacts created by Bismarck and carried on after World War One. We're going to supply news equally to these two news agencies so it can be sent out as quickly as possible. Um, so I sort of delve into these sort of really bureaucratic minutiae because they're actually really important debates about speed versus accuracy. Um, and, and in the end, you know, one of the things that, that in some ways undermines um, the Weimar Republic's ability to report um, accurate news is that um, they start to rely more on speed. Yeah, and that you see that exact same trend with the advent of 24 hour news and that, that pressure to break the story, break break the news. Just, just one re last question around, around that is, is how all of that reflects in today's news landscape, that, that sort of intersection between local news, national news, investigative journalism, you know, that that fact check news and that the kind of internet environment, what, what's happening to our news now? Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought up the question of local because I think it's actually another arena where looking at this historically really helped me to see that that was one of the, the key problems developing in the present. So one of the things that, that I saw happening over the course of the Weimar Republic was that more and more newspapers that appeared to be independent were in fact basically carbon cutouts of news agency news and, and that in particular Alfred Hugenberg was, was using his vertically integrated media empire to supply effectively they were called Kopflors of Zeitung or headless newspapers so everything was pre-created on a, on a sheet apart from the title of the newspaper all sent through you know Telegraph Union um, and this was sent around Germany and increased in power as hyperinflation and other costs eroded the ability of newspapers to actually have any staff whatsoever. Um, so let's say you were a local person sitting in, I don't know, Dessau or somewhere like that, you might be reading a newspaper thinking it was your own because it was given that title, but actually the whole of the news was supplied by a news agency behind the scenes. So it really eroded um, the power of having really any local news. Um, but if you were an ordinary person sitting in a village, you would have no way of knowing that that was happening. 
Um, and so this to me is one of the concerns that we have today as well, this erosion of local news, the, and, and the inability of many people who are accessing different types of news to really understand what is happening. If you look even at pretty big newspapers today, you see that more and more of that news is coming from news agencies, um, something that actually um, Nick Cohen, right, uh, who was a Guardian reporter, he wrote a whole book about, <laughs> about this back in 2011, actually about the increasing power of news and press agencies and what a problem that was. Um, so I see a very weird parallel actually. So even if you look at quite big newspapers, you'll see them rely more and more on news agencies, particularly for their international news because foreign correspondents are so expensive Part of the reason why newspapers, of course, have less money is because of the role of platforms, etc. Um, but I think pointing to the role of local news and many people's lack of understanding of why this is happening is actually a very weird parallel and a, and a real problem if we think about the role of news, which is often to inform us about our local circumstances. Yeah, I'm just, I've just got one last question coming. I'm going to squeeze one more in. One last question coming from the floor. How did the Wall Street crash impact upon these uh, communication companies and agencies? Did it have a, an effect on them? I imagine it did. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, as, as with hyperinflation, um, it has effects on the number of newspapers that exist. And because newspapers are the clients of news agencies, um, that's when it puts them into financial difficulties. Um, so when you have fewer clients, obviously you have less revenue. So you have to consolidate in different kinds of ways. So in the case of um, German news agencies, it, um, it makes Wolfs once again, like with hyperinflation, more reliant on the state than ever. And it's part of what undermines their financial stability, leading to um, the Weimar government buying it. And then when the Nazis come to power, the, the ability to merge the two of them. So it just reduces the number of clients and, and makes them somewhat even more susceptible to outside influence. Well, Heidi, it's been absolutely fascinating to, to talk to you this evening about both the past and the present. And I just wanted to end because I think it's entirely appropriate to end in this place from a comment from Martin Frankel, who, who loved your book. And, and he says, I'm going to read it out um, word for word. Um, Through your scholarship, you showed the abiding relevance of, of the study of history. My father, who founded this prize, and for whom it is named, worked in a press cutting agency for six years after World War II. And he says in his own small way, he too was choosing the news which was relevant to the agency's clients. Topics don't change much, but the technology does. Oh, well, that's a wonderful way to end. <laughs> Perfect way to end. So thank you so much, Heidi. I'm going to hand back to, to Toby to, to close the event. It's been fascinating. Thank you, Joe. That's really good. Now, I actually wanted to thank you as well for moderating the event so brilliantly. Um, so, yes, what an absolutely fascinating conversation. I will just also let you in. To, before the, the event started, uh, I uh, mentioned that when I first joined the library, one of the first things uh, that I learned about was that Ernst... Uh, one of the things that he did with, with, with Franco Prize winners is he offered to take them for lunch as a way of saying thank you, which is actually a tradition that we wish we could continue today. And if it weren't for the pandemic, we would do. But uh, we effectively promise that Heidi, as soon as the pandemic is over, the Wiener Library owes you a lunch. <laughs> so we're, we're, I very much look forward to being able to, to, uh, to offer that as an addition to the prize. But for now, we want to basically offer you our congratulations and our thanks for this evening. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone.